Welcome to the Rad Dad Show. Today, my guest is Aviel Ginsberg. He's a managing partner of Alexa Accelerator here in Seattle. He's also a partner of Founders Co-op, where he is a VC, and he's a co-founder of Simply Measured. Aviel and I will talk about founding of Simply Measured, what it's like to be a new dad, what it's like to be a dad while working in a high-stress work environment, and as always with founders, we'll talk a little bit about startup life and everything in between. Lastly, he'll share some tips on traveling with the little ones. Also, if you like to ask me or Aviel any questions or would like Aviel to come back to talk in more detail about something you hear in this episode, please let me know by emailing to editor at raddadshow.com. All right, let's jump right in. Welcome. You uh, went on an interesting path. You went from a software engineer to a co-founder of Simply Measured, then a VC and now a manager at the Alexa Accelerator by Techstars. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> it's been a little bit of a journey the past decade. I mean, it's pretty awesome. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and how that prepared you to be where you are now? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, really the way that everything kind of started for me was was almost, I mean, I don't want to call it random, but it, it sort of was random where I, I decided I was either going to move to Seattle or San Francisco um, a little bit after I graduated college when I knew that the startup that I was building with one of my friends from high school wasn't going to work. And by wasn't going to work, I mean wasn't even really going to start because we had no idea what we were doing and ego is way too large for, uh, for our capabilities. Um, so decided I wanted to go somewhere to actually learn what, what is, what is building a startup? What is building software actually all about? So I moved, I I decided to move to Seattle because I had a, a friend out here and it was just an easier transition. Shockingly, I actually didn't know anyone in San Francisco and my third day in Seattle was the first Seattle Startup Weekend. And this is back when Startup Weekend was just getting started. This had to be, you know, in the first five that was ever thrown. It could have actually even been the second or third. And this is also back when it was not like the Startup Weekends are today where you break up on these small teams. It was that everyone works on one company together, which is preposterous. There's 150 people Um you know, we're working, uh, together on one idea. And the way that that we actually broke into, into roles was they asked, you know, raise your hand. If you want to be the head of engineering, raise your hand. If you want to be blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they got to the point of saying, raise your hand. If you want to be the head of uh, design, nobody raised their hand. Um, I thought to myself, okay, like I'm, I've been running software for the past decade. I've done some web design work. My father's an artist. I don't suck at this, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but no one else is raising their hand and actually I'm just really here to network. So what the hell? So I, I raised my hand and suddenly then I was thrust into conversations with people who were super well connected and well established within the Seattle ecosystem. And then come the next week, I had a job offer to work at. Aperture as a software <laughs> engineer, um, and that was back when that was just, you know, I think, five or six of us in a makeshift office space, and that company went on to raise venture and have a really successful exit. So I sort of accidentally found myself at the beginning of a small startup that was on kind of the exact journey that I wanted to go myself. So the amount of learnings and connections that I got into that was was kind of kind of preposterous and and uh when it came to me wanting to say okay now it's finally time for me to go out on my own and start my own company uh i had established relationships with the investors in that company who wanted to back me a little known story damon and i who is my original co-founder for simply measured we both got asked to be eirs at madrona to explore the social space I ended up turning that down to stay at the company a little bit longer, but it was a lot of those conversations and that work that ended up leading us to uh, found Simply Measured, which interestingly as well was founded by Founders Co-op, where I'm now a partner. Uh, but Founders Co-op was also an investor in Aperture, which is how I got to know Founders Co-op. Um, so it's just such a ridiculously small world, but just sort of being open to, sure, I'll do that. Sure, I'll go to this. I'll raise my hand. I'll figure this out. Um led me to being in the right place at the right time, which gave me the the learnings and connections I needed to found Simply Measured. And, you know, as, as time went on after founding that company, I just, I really love that early stage so much. So I've been involved in helping do Techstar selection since 2010, mentoring in the program, working on lots of startups, and just have always gravitated towards that zero to 20 people, the, the part where 
you know, you don't quite have product market fit, or if you do, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, you know, the whole journey is ahead of you. And I found as, as Simply Measured went on that that's also where I'm, I'm the best. The Simply Measured grew past 100 people. I was a fish out of water trying to be a, a manager, and that's not necessarily where I wanted to focus my time and growth. So I started helping out a lot more on the tech star side and helping founders co-op with, with diligence and, you know, sort of one day kind of woke up and realized that even though I didn't have the title, I pretty much was a venture partner at the fund. Um, and as things began to, to, um, you know, kind of move forward, it simply measured, uh, with me not in a leadership role. I started moving more and more into that world. And then sure, you'll, you'll want to dig in a little bit towards, you know, simply measured acquisition and some of those things, which, uh, super related to this because it was about that time that I, I had my kid. My son is 15 months old. So, so I kind of had, had my kid and then went through this massive transition where I had my feet in multiple worlds. And then now I have them, both of them firmly in the, the investor and VC world. So that's, that's a quick, quick run through the past 10 years. <laughs> well, that's pretty amazing. And all of it came out in a way out of a three-day startup weekend. Mark and the team really don't get enough credit for that. Yeah, right? well, and actually, th- hilariously, that was when Andrew Hyde was running it, and Mark and Clint were at that startup weekend with me. Clint actually became my best, my first best friend in Seattle, um, and I introduced them to Andrew Hyde and <laughs> worked with them negotiating the purchase of it from him. So, yeah, man, this is like, this is the real early days. I was in the middle of all of that. Wow, and it's, it's only been a few years, right, in the <laughs> grand scheme of things. <clears throat> it's fascinating. What do you think you enjoyed the most? Was it the, um, the co-founding phase before it got past 20 people? You, you know, like, it actually probably was the, the 10 to 20. Like, the early stages where, you know, it's just you, you're always, especially if you feel like you're onto something, you're, like, frustrated because you're not actually able to, like, create the world that you know that needs to exist. You don't there's not enough time in the day you don't have enough resources and that like 10 to 20 was when there still wasn't structure people could still really be driven and take take things in their own hands you didn't have to worry about management and process but you finally had enough resources to like really tackle the problem and see like are we capable of doing this and can we really prove out that there is a market for a product like that 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 phase which is like um I, i tend to break down startups and you know uh, at first there's, there's, can this exist? And then there's, well, should this exist? And then, okay, well, how does this exist? And I kind of like the, uh, you know, that middle phase there. Out of all the ideas at the time, why was it simply measured that really drove you? Uh, you know, this is, this is embarrassing because I, 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 I started the company in the, in the, in a way that I never encouraged anyone else to do it. Um, we actually founded the company as Untitled Startup, raised our first 150 k without an idea. Uh, the plan was that we were going to tackle the PR and marketing space doing something related to social, and that the first product we were going to build was a sort of hybrid forum voting platform so that we could get, so we could largely like crowdsource and easily get public opinion on what we should build. And that was what we actually raised money for. And, you know, we spent all this time, released it, and we built an audience through putting out daily videos. I mean, we literally had thousands of people following us, but that idea was pretty awful. Um, all the ideas we were getting were, were useless. Like, it was, it was like, what, what, are, what are we doing here? And then uh, about six months into that experiment, Damon and I said, you know, We've, we're good friends. We've, we've hacked on tons of projects together, but we've never actually built and shipped something end to end together. So why don't we just do our own little mini startup weekend, lock ourselves in your house and from start to finish build a product and just, just do it like, okay. Um, and you know, nobody's really coming to our platform yet. So why don't we just ask on Twitter what we should build? And we did that. We started getting a, a bunch of responses. Damon was copying and pasting those things into a Google doc. And then it hit him. He's like, whoa, you know, Twitter just released this new streaming API thing. We could just build something that streams the tweets that we're copying and pasting into this spreadsheet into a Google Doc. So basically just automate the process that we're doing. They kind of looked at each other and laughed and said, oh, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, we're doing that. Um, and we built the whole prototype 
in the weekend and the prototype actually included payments. That was a big thing for us. And we crashed really, really hard Sunday uh, night, woke up at like, and, and launched it and woke up at like 7 a.m. I woke up first and there's like emails saying, I, uh, you know, it's not working. What the hell? I paid good money for this and woke Damon up. I'm like, oh my God, people are paying for what we built. And also it doesn't work. Um, but maybe we're actually onto something. And what's really funny is the agreement that we made when we took the 150 K, uh, with Andy Sack, who, who led the round for founders co-op was that we would not build a social media monitoring application. That was the agreement. He believed that that space was actually already won and figured out. So we could do anything in social except a social media monitoring app. And we built one and immediately people started to pay for it. And within a couple of weeks, we found that things were breaking left and right. And we're like, why is this happening? Well, turns out that the, the, the person at Edelman who does all of PR for BlackBerry was using it. It was, we were actually breaking Google Sheets. Um, I mean, it was just like a wild, wild experience where we just got pulled into this world and realized that we had the technical, technical expertise and just started listening to our customers. And over time, we realized that it wasn't just this low end product that people wanted. They actually wanted an enterprise grade solution to help them measure and, and evolve their social strategies. And it was about a year into that. And we had brought Adam on as our third co-founder and became CEO um, that there really was this large enterprise opportunity. Um, and hilariously, part of where we realized that opportunity existed was that we would start getting phone calls from procurement departments saying, um, why is there this item for a $500 charge to untitled startup? Uh, what, what is this shit? Uh, so we realized we kind of needed to update our branding and everything and go in that direction. So again, like this was not really the proper lean startup methodology. This was not founders who were like super passionate about a uh, specific problem and solving. This was just people who loved working together, uh, loved tinkering with social APIs. And we just wanted an excuse to get to make this our full-time job, both in working with each other and do the things we love. So we followed the money and that's how Simply Measure came to be. That's a fascinating story, and I think you just touched on a couple of really great points. I've heard before of multiple really kind of famous startups starting out of startup weekend like mentality, where founders were just exploring stuff, just puts you know uh, landing pages out there, and eventually hits uh, hit gold. Uh, but it's kind of funny that you're not advising people to do this, even though it worked for you, right? Um, it, it, well, here here's the thing: is that if, if, <laughs> if you're starting the way that we started, like you're not actually ready to raise capital. Like we only took in 150 K and we were, we were ourselves just paying ourselves $36,000 a year each. So it was really just to get us to, to be able to sustain and live. But you know, we, we weren't really ready to do it. It wasn't until like a year in when we really realized what we were doing with simply measured that I think we, we were on the venture track. Like, I think people can put themselves in a bad position to say, hey, I have this idea, I think this is going to work, and then raise way too much money and suddenly realize that they've already committed towards playing a game before they know the rules. And that's that's a, a, a mistake. Um, and the other thing, too, is like we were lucky that we figured it out within six months. It could have been 18 months. It could have been years. Um, you know, we were... I like to see people a little bit further along when, when I invest in them. Um, and I want to support them when they're in the stage that we were. But, you know, you really can get over your skis and suddenly start thinking like, oh, God, we raised all this money. We have to hire. We have to hit this. We have to get customers. We have to do it. And we were just able to work at our own pace. And I think that's that's something that's, that's really important that gets forgotten um, a lot these days is you think that you have to look the same way as everyone else. And the reality is when you do start to take – uh, venture specifically, you know, I do mean like institutional capital rather than angel money. Um, it starts to put you on a specific trajectory and you have to look a specific way. And until you're ready to do that, you can make a mistake doing it too early. Right. It's important to realize what venture money is for. That it's kind of just a tool that will help you grow, help you discover things you need to discover, right? But but then I love it because that means everyone who wants to start a startup right now, if they just found a smart friend or a couple and buckle down for a few days in their house, they could start the next Simply Measured or the next, you know. The, yeah, the reality is that no matter where you are and what you're doing, you may be three days away from starting a Simply Measured. <laughs> uh, Simply Measured is an extremely fitting name for this, too. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's get away from startups for a little bit, but we'll circle back. I mean, I love startups. Um, but now that you're a dad, you know, how's it been? 15 months? Oh, <laughs> I mean, exhausting. Uh, my voice usually doesn't sound this way. Last night was uh, actually a pretty good night. I think I got four hours of, of sleep straight, uh, which is like almost a personal best. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's an incredible, incredible experience that I think the the weirdest part about it is that everything that everyone said it was going to be like was empirically correct, but so different than what I imagined. Like, you know, this is going to happen. You're going to feel this way. This is going to happen. But it wasn't until I actually experienced, had the kid and experienced these things myself that I got it. Um, and that's, you know, one of the, the first times in my life that I've actually experienced something like that, because I tend to think that, you know, I can, I can learn from other people's experiences. I can read, I can internalize, and I can make decisions off of it. Having a kid was the first time I've experienced that just simply not being true, and it's only because of personal experience that I can do that. Don't want to go back into the startup world, but it actually gave me a really interesting insight working with founders. Like one of the biggest mistakes that uh, former founders who go into VC make is that they imagine themselves in the other person's shoes, um, making decisions that same way, feeling the same way, Um, and this experience, uh, along with, you know, some of the initial investments I made gave me a lot more, um, a lot more of a realization that all of our experiences are unique in the way that we internalize it and deal with it are unique. Um, so being smarter about that when I invest in companies and just also realizing everyone is on their own journey and has their own shit going on in their personal life and not to, not to discount that. Um, so I don't know. I hope that made sense. (laughs) No, that that uh, absolutely made sense. But you know, with your own kid, you can be a dad and you can directly influence it. With a company, you're still kind of an advisor, right? That must be hard now that you know what it's like to be a dad. I mean, totally. But my son's only 15 months, so you know, it, it's it's actually only been in the past several months that we've really been able to communicate with each other, which has just been amazing. It's still mostly nonverbal, but like. You know, I, I can say, do you want to do this? What do you want to do? He can give me direction. He can tell me what, what he wants. I can, I can tell him, you know, what I'd like him to do. But really for the first, like, you know, nine months, arguably 12, um, th- there, it's an illusion that like actually like being a, a dad or a parent is like being a boss or a leader. I mean, it actually is a lot more like being a, <laughs> an advisor in some ways because he's got his own agenda. He's got his own needs. And, uh, you know, I, I can't just say stop crying or wait five minutes. The food will be ready. That's not quite how it works. I need to figure out how to connect with them on a different level. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> so funny. No, I, I know it's funny you bring it up, right? Because not, stop anything. I mean, it really doesn't end there. You know, uh, my oldest is three year old now, and you can't really tell her to stop crying. Sometimes you really want to. Because if it happens, you know, because you're like, you don't want it to hurt. Like, you're like, stop crying. But then you're like, wait, no. I mean, uh, like, she can't process that, right? She's not an adult. Yeah, and I, I really think that, like, you know, uh, there's some amazing lessons, like, for having a kid that, if you know, I ever go back into a world where I'm, you know, managing a large organization, I'll I'll, I'll realize a lot more, like, things that I don't have uh, control over. Like, you know, it, it's, it's funny. Like, a- every day I draw some new parallel towards, like, oh, wow. That situation I had three years ago is really related to what I'm dealing with right now. You know, I was reading Sarah Lace's book um, about well, a lot of things, but part of it was on parenting. And she mentioned that in the workplace, you can always spot who the parents are. Because whenever uh, everything goes to shits, parents really just calmly go through and do their thing. Because they're so used to the fact that they don't have any control. It's just, uh, you know. Totally. Couldn't agree usual. more. Yeah. Yeah. But um, do you have any favorite memories so far? I mean, 15 months is a lot of months. <sighs> you know, the I, the first time that he, like, belly laughed that I got that, that, like, saw that pure joy of being alive that, you know, I had forgotten even existed. Like, I don't think I've experienced that in decades. Um, and that he was he was on his changing table and just touched my head and he just lost it like violent belly laughing I'm like what the hell is happening and then i put my head back down and he did it again and we were like caught in like an infinite loop for 30 minutes with him doing this infectious belly laugh like we got to put him down to nap like i don't want to stop this let's do this until he is no longer laughing like that and after 30 minutes 
we had to like actually give up because he would not stop doing it. Um, but you know, like so much of the first many months of having a kid are like the kid being upset. Um, I like to joke, so you know the, the, the Paul Graham, like, is your startup default dead or default alive? Like, in the early days of a baby, the baby is not default alive. And there's, there's this magical moment where, like, it wants to live more than it, it is, like, on a path towards death, such as, like, it doesn't eat every two hours. If you're not paying attention, if this happens, it's going to, you know, it, it can, it, there's SIDS, there's all these things that are just totally nuts. But then there's this moment of, of your baby now wants to live and that belly laugh of just like, I'm here and I actually love this. This is so amazing. Thank you for making me. Uh, I swear I'm not always like really upset and miserable that I'm always in some state of too full, not full enough, uncomfortable, growing in pain. And that was just such a magical experience. So I was like, okay, I get this. This is, this is, this is so rewarding. I, I, I love it. It's amazing because, you know, not many dads can say this. I mean, a lot do, but a lot of dads also kind of stay far away from the kids and let the moms take care of the babies. Uh, so the fact that you're just so excited about this is amazing. I mean, you know, that it, to be to be honest, though, it took a long time um, to get to that. Like the first several months were were really hard. Um, you know, I, I never I never actually ended up. Um, uh, going in to get an actual diagnosis. Uh, but, uh, I've had depression in the past and very confident that, you know, the first six months I actually ended up with, uh, sort of the male version of postpartum, which is kind of embarrassing to admit because it's, you know, you don't have the same chemical reaction to try and justify it. But the first six months were like really, really hard. Um, I ended up taking pretty much no time off. Um, I had, I had a meeting with a potential acquirer for Simply Measured three days after my baby was born. Um, you know, it was, it was like rough. I was working my ass off. I had lots of other things to deal with. So, you know, for me in the early part where you have this like baby that does nothing but like, it's sort of like the first six months are like little vampires. And then you have all this like complicated stuff going on at work. You, you have tons of high stress situations. Like, I, I was, I was like not in a good place where I was like frustrated at work for keeping me away from the baby. And then I was frustrated at the baby for keeping me away from performance at work and then frustrated at my like wife when she needed me to take care of stuff. Like the first six months were, were, were pretty damn ugly. So, you know, that moment when stuff kind of clicked there was really important for me because it was, it was like, not only can I do this, but also like, I actually enjoy this and don't feel like this is taking away from my life, but is actually adding to it. I'm so glad that you're saying this, not because you went through depression, but because so many people do, but they don't talk about it. It's, uh, everybody just pretends that once the baby comes around, everything is happy and lovely. And then, you know, two years later, people end up divorcing. So Yeah, I mean, the, the, my whole relationship with my partner fundamentally changed. It was like you have your existing rules of engagement and then and you get into a pattern and then your relationship becomes built around that pattern. That whole thing gets thrown out the window. And it's almost like you have to go through the process of like of of like, okay, who are you now? Who are we in this context? Do we still work together? Do we still like each other? Do we still get along? But there's all these other parts of your life that remain the same. Like you still have that same work environment. Like because you you kind of like tailor your your home life, your personal relationships around a lot of these other things, especially in a, in a, in a startup culture where like the order of operations it, for me then with like when I had the baby was number one priority is, is my, is my company, like is my startup. Like I wrecked my long-term relationship when I founded Simply Measure because that is what I did. Um, you know, you're encouraged as founders to do that. So it was that. And then it was kind of my long-term success and being able to um, establish myself as someone who is like well known, is successful, and can therefore support my family. And then sort of family number three, because the idea is like you you go out, you conquer, and then you use those things to support your family. And then after I had the baby, it was like, whoa, holy shit, baby's number one, and then there is no number two, and then number three is my wife because she takes care of the baby. And like suddenly the the whole prioritization of all that goes completely fucking out the window, except nothing else has changed. You still show up to your job. You're still in those same meetings. You're still doing all these same things. But, but at least for me, everything about my prioritization changed. I'm like, that was a disaster for me. How did you eventually get yourself out of it? I mean, I, I had really good P 
people around me, like people inside of the company who recognized and, and the, the investors too, who realized that I was like not really in a good place. So, you know, they kind of gave me a path towards being able to be in a, a role that was not critical path or hands on and, and also be able to kind of explore, um, you know, taking on that tech stores role, doing some other stuff that helped me balance my life better and also, you know, made me made me happy and made me feel feel like I was I had like a future and that the whole world wasn't caving in on me. So it was just having awesome people like specifically um, simply measured CEO at the time. Um, Michael Wazaluka was just like an amazing partner and supporter who like even though he knew that, um, you know, me spending more time at home and spending more time on, you know, in, in this case, it was, it was like tech stars and, and that other world was going to come at a cost to, you know, him needing to spend, you know, deal with some things on his own that we previously had done as a team and me spending less time um, involved with Simply Measured. Like he, he just, he knew it's what I, I needed and he was just amazingly supportive. And, you know, so were my co-founders and a whole bunch of key employees. So, you know, really just being able to not be caught in, you know, high stress startup world in a role that I wasn't you know, really finding success at was having the support to do that was incredible. I mean, there's there's one thing where just like, you know, you found a startup and then you sort of do it indefinitely. And your job as a founder is to always do whatever needs to be done. Um, but like I definitely after having the kid reached the point where, um, you know, we all talk about like after you have kids, you, you kind of, you can start really failing at self care. And like as a startup founder, you're just by definition probably terrible at it. Um, you know, as awful as this is, there tends to be a pretty strong correlation between like people who, whose companies perform well and having really bad work life balance. So that's certainly one of those people. Um, so, you know, it was just like after the baby, it just got so bad that I was like, wow, I probably should have made some course corrections many years ago, but now, now it's urgent. So what do you think people who are running startups or even not even startups who are in a high stress work environment and going to have kids could do in order to prepare themselves uh, short of quitting their job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of it is like really making sure that you're on the same page with your partner and that you have the ability to, you know, to trade off and support each other. And then also, you know, if you have family who can do that as well, because you really just don't know what's going to happen, how it's, how it's going to go. Um, and I think the other thing is, is, you know, as you get older, you get better at figuring out how to work, work smarter. So you don't have to work as many hours. You're just much more thoughtful about how you work and more productive in that time. Um, and I really think that developing that muscle before you have the kid uh, is a really important thing. And I'd say the other is that you just have to recognize that for the first six months, it, it, you're going to be in reactive mode. Like if you're trying to learn a new skill at work, uh, learn a new muscle, it, it, it's like lead an initiative. You're not going to be doing it justice, especially for that first six months, because you're trying to, to readjust your own life and figure out who you are. So I think being having a good support network and being realistic about what you're going to be able to accomplish. And then also practicing the, the ways that you're going to need to work rather than suddenly being blindsided by the fact that you have all these other priorities. Um, is something I would encourage everyone to do. And I definitely had the, the, the support network, but I was, I was probably missing the other two in ways I should have had. That, that makes sense. And I'm so glad you said it about, you know, uh, learning to be more efficient because I feel like in Silicon Valley in general, there's this notion that that's complete and out of BS and that uh, you just need to work for 24 hours a day in order to be successful, which I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't work, you know, as hard as you can, but I think it's like, it's, it's a legitimate thing that you can just really be very good at what you do and therefore save you some time that you can then bring to other places. Yeah. The, uh, there was, there's one way. And again, like this doesn't apply for all roles, but you know, I, I, uh, people ask me like, what do you like? What do you do for a living? Like you're not writing software anymore. Like what, what is the job of like, uh, an, a, an investor? Like what, what is this? And even like people question when they, there's like this naive approach of like individual contributors, like my manager does nothing. Um, like there's this whole type of job or like, what do you do for a living? What you actually do is you make decisions and you help other people make decisions. And the reality read is like how you can be good at that is by having the capacity to make a lot of decisions or help people make a lot of decisions. And then therefore, like statistically, a lot of those will be right. 
But I think what you need to be focusing on is making less decisions, but making them better. And that's sort of my version and how I explain the like work smart rather than work hard. So when I think about sort of like what is the difference between work smart and work hard, especially in the capacity of like what I do is that like as as like for my job, it's making decisions. So like who who do I invest in and helping folks make decisions. So helping founders work through the challenges that that, you know, they're 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 struggling with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think where I'm able to save time is some decisions are like, this isn't a decision. We shouldn't be investing time in this. This doesn't matter. Like focusing on helping in those areas that really matter and making and, and only myself making decisions that I think are, are ones that can be truly impactful. Like the rest of the rest of your life, the rest of the things that you do, like realizing that this actually isn't that important. And if we just do this one thing right, those other things don't matter at all. And just being really thoughtful about that saves you a ton of time. Right. So it's not like you do less work per day, but your work is more impactful because you're contributing to the right aspects. Correct. Makes sense. Uh, ah, wisdom. It's wonderful. <laughs> you know, I'm curious. A couple of days ago on Twitter, you said, my goal for 2018 <laughs> is to start saying, I don't care instead of I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Can you explain that? <laughs> yeah, that that was that was more uh, me mostly joking around. But why I I'm not actually going to do that. But the reason why I said it is that I I just find it actually goes along with what I just said there. Like it's it's exhausting. Like every time you don't know something, I at least feel like I then need to learn about it so that I can have an opinion. Um, Like we right now live in this world of so much information overload that we tend to like not really go deep on everything. So just generally taking the opinion of like, yeah, I don't understand that, but I'm just going to say I don't care because I'm going to focus my time elsewhere um, is, is just the general mentality that I'm adopting. And that was sort of my like facetious way of tweeting that out in kind of like a uh, sort of extreme fashion. Um. Oh, the, I love it because it's also good advice, I think, for all of us. <clears throat> Indeed, there's just so much to read that the more you read, the more you discover that you want to read something else, for example, but you never actually get time to go deep and learn this one thing. And at the end of the day, you can spend the, the entire day just consuming opinions. and. Yeah, well, and my, my, I think also my, my parents were in town at the time, and they tend to watch like CNN and the, t- the 24 hours news cycle nonstop. So, you know... It's always like, did you hear about this? Like, what about this? Or thought on this? And I was like, like, rather than like, I don't know, I actually just started saying like, I don't care. Like, I just don't care. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. Um, <laughs> I, I've done this with my mom. She gets so offended. Um, <laughs> it, it, but it's not like, you know, it's not like I don't care about you. I just don't care about the subject and I don't want it to consume my mind. Right. I don't want to spend the next five minutes where like, I get that you can try to explain it to me. I do not want to spend the next five minutes doing that. I don't care. (laughs) Uh, Let's leave work for a little bit. So you guys went traveling with your uh, 15 months old, although I guess it was a few months ago. Um, How was it? So we've been on a lot of trips, uh, like a lot of trips. So when he was, uh, how old would that have been? Four or five months, we went to Hawaii Um, since then he's done a trip to, uh, Pennsylvania. He's been to Boulder, Colorado. He's been to Florida. He's been to Oregon. He's been to Napa. And then he's been back again to, uh, to DC and Pennsylvania. So VC is just vacation all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so what, what we actually started doing is, um, uh, when I have a, uh, so some of those are, are like, um, you know, holidays like uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all that. But when I actually have work travel, uh, trying to tag along before the trip or after the trip, just bring the whole family and make a short trip of it. Um, so that's actually where a lot of that happened. Like the, the Oregon, California, uh, Colorado trips were all like just tweaking a work trip into a, a family trip. Um, and so it's it's been kind of wild. Like, he's, he's really good on airplanes, which I was so stressed about. Like I was one of those people who I would, before I had a kid, I get mad at people whose kid would be like loud and annoy me. Like I had no idea. Now I'm just so stressed because I know there's other people like I used to be. (laughs) So I like, it's, it's a, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like looking around at people like, who's, 
who's the old me here that's going to get angry and like how do I like give them like the stink eye before they start like looking at me that way um, here's an idea a, a short for airplanes it just says wait a couple of years yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're going to be here eventually yeah and a- actually what was what was nice was the first trip which was to Hawaii like that was, I was really nervous because it was the first time. And the whole plane was like families with little kids. It was like the loudest, craziest flight I've ever been on. But when, when, when my son Espen was screaming, it didn't feel bad at all because everyone else was screaming as well. Um, but like the biggest challenges have been like routine, right? Like how, how you pull off having kids. You have like, a, at least this is how we do, like a really rigid routine of, here's when you do this, here's when you do this, there's this many times, there's this much in between here and between here and here. And the first couple trips, it was really difficult keeping the routine because we found like, wow, we traveled to this amazing place and we did nothing. Um, like we didn't even leave the hotel room. Um, so really what we've done is like always stay in um, Airbnbs. We do cloth diapers and we opted to say that is just too complicated while we're traveling for our first couple trips. We maintain doing cloth diapers and we basically just spent the entire trip cleaning diapers, which was a mistake. Um, so, so just realizing that, that you have to let your routine go a little bit, but you need to keep enough of it so that, you know, everything doesn't just fall apart. Um, mm-hmm. figuring out how to, how to eat, eat out and like make sure that the baby's always happy was a, was a big key thing for us bringing white noise and bringing uh so my, my son loves uh, Alexa bringing a, mm-hmm. uh, um, a tap with us so that Alexa and the songs and all that stuff is just with us wherever we go has been great. Um, and I think the was, there was another thing that's been like a really, um, uh, big learning. Um, uh, I, I guess that's the majority of it. Like we, we've just kind of figured out how to do it and it's been, it's I'm like he's he's a good traveler. Like I feel really really lucky at, at how it's gone thus far. So in other words, once you figure out the routines, it's not a big deal. Just do it, and you'll figure it out. Yeah. In the process. Oh oh, I remember the one other hack, which is like don't try and change the time zones. So it actually works perfectly because he eats at like five forty five six o'clock here, and then when we go to the East Coast, we just have really late dinners, and we keep him on like that that uh, that that time zone change. Because our first trip to Hawaii was like a hilarious mistake. You know, Hawaii is like three hours earlier. And so we finally arrived. It's like 1130 at night. He's in Hawaii and he's asleep. So we're like, ah, we made it. It's so beautiful here. We, we like open up a bottle of wine and we're just like, ah, this is just so wonderful. And then we go to sleep at like, uh, at like 1230 and then he wakes up at three and he's wide awake. And we're like, oh, fuck, we <laughs> forgot about this. Like, shit. Um, so that that was definitely a, a rude awakening for us. Ah, uh, kids, they're lovely. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you, I guess, you know, you could go outside and watch the stars. Yeah. Um, well, since we're running a little short on time, let me ask you a couple more questions cool. before we go. Uh, let's see. Actually, speaking of uh, Techstars and uh, Alexa, uh, you, uh, Techstars has a lot of... Uh, last time I was in Apple Store, there were a lot of toys for kids, mm-hmm. um, or I guess for young adults uh, from Techstars. There was Sphero, Rich Robotics, Sensible Objects, and maybe some other ones. There's some others coming, um, too, that are uh, Techstars which, as well. Which, they're, like, they're really cool, but when, when do you think is the right time to introduce technology to the kid? I know it's a little early for 15 months, but... Yeah. God, that's, that's, that's such a, that's such a good question. And like, I, I really, really struggle with that. I mean, we're, we're, we're strong believers in no screens before two. Um, but in terms of he, he already loves Alexa. I'm worried that, that Alexa will actually be his like first word other than mom and dad. Um, but in terms of like, uh, like some of those, those toys, like, Really, I think it's just like a lesser of, of of two evils where whenever it's like too difficult to keep him away from, from screens, video games and all of that, I want to throw everything at me at him to get him to, to wait as long as possible. Um, and so there's like all these great toys that are like really cool multimodal experiences that give you a lot of the engagement and excitement of something that's digital while still being like 
like tactile and and still stimulating your imagination in the ways that that I, I think that like physical toys only do because we were wired as human beings to work that way. So mm-hmm. I don't have a good answer, but I'm 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 going to try everything to to get him to play with all that stuff rather than than you know I want him to play with Legos rather than for for longer for. I wanted to play with Legos well into, you know, his, his childhood rather than immediately migrate to Minecraft. Like I, that, that's, that's what I want to have happen. I want him to be playing with you know, like the play impossible game ball that, that came out of the LX accelerator rather than playing FIFA. Um, you know, I know eventually that switch will happen, but I'm, I'm going to do my best to delay it as long as possible. Do you feel like as a VC, you're now more inclined to fund all sorts of baby related startups? Oh my God, totally. I was, it was ridiculous. Like my, my biases have totally shifted where I just didn't get that, those types of tech before in the same way that like, I would always think like when you're watching a TV show and there's like a baby who's sick or dies or in danger, I'd be like, that's contrived. And like now I'm fucking bawling when that stuff happens. Like it's, it's so ridiculous how all of that changes. Um, but yeah, I definitely was laughing about that because as we were looking at companies for the Lex accelerator, I was like, I-, I would just have not got this before. And <laughs> now I totally do. Um, like no- novel effect, which was in the Lex accelerator as well. Um, you know, j- I was, I was aware of them generally before the program, but then after I had a kid and he loves reading, I suddenly like started using the product and loving it. And they ended up in the program. And I think that I wouldn't have been as helpful to them maybe not have even like, you know, gone after recruiting them if, uh, if I didn't have a kid. Huh. I'll, I'll have to check it out. So last question, uh, what are you now most excited about the future? Really? It's more and more communication with, with my son, like so much of the beginning of it. Like I felt like, like babies are little energy vampires. Now I have these moments where he does something so amazing that I get so exciting, so excited. And I get, I get so much energy because of that, but like really being able to communicate with him, like understanding how he thinks about things, like how his brain is wiring together, the mental models he's creating. Like, I'm just so excited to talk with my kid, like figure out who he actually is. Um, like that's the thing I'm, I'm the most excited for by a, a, a wide margin. Like I joke with my wife that, you know, everyone says like you don't want a teenager like i can't wait to have like really complicated stimulating conversations with them like some of my best memories of of my grandfather who used to live with us and and favorite memories of my dad when i was younger was like us having these giant arguments over dinner about like politics and world world like world uh events um in, in almost like a uh uh uh, what's the uh, um, duh, 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 duh. brain isn't quite working from lack of sleep? Um, like arguing over the Talmud. Like it, it's just uh-huh. I, I I can't wait to do that with them. So well, first you're gonna pass the phase where they're not gonna want to talk to you, and it's uh, all gonna be uh, by themselves. Uh-huh. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean they, they only get more exciting literally every day as you see them grow. Yeah, man. Uh, Thank you for coming on the show, even though it's been brief, but it's been awesome. I can hear how excited you are about having a kid. Maybe it's four hours of sleep, uh, you know, but, but you're certainly one of the most excited dads I've talked about when it comes to parenting. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what your son grows up like. Uh, maybe he'll be the next uh, you know, CEO of Amazon, <laughs> yeah. of the, oh, of, oh, Amazon of the future. and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Well, I really, I really appreciate you, you having me on here. And I think one thing to just kind of leave it with is like, you know, I, I didn't really know that I wanted to be a dad. I also didn't really know what kind of dad I was going to be. And, you know, having the kid was so much about like, it's just sort of what you're supposed to, to do. And, you know, in the early days, it felt like it was something that maybe my wife wanted more than I did. Um, and then after meeting him and having him, like, it was just, I, I can't even believe that I would have ever thought that way previously. It's such an incredible experience. Um, it's amazing. Well, here's to another couple of kids then. <laughs> one more, only one more. <laughs> That's what you're saying now. I know. But yeah. It saying. gets, it gets exponentially harder. FYI. Yeah. Well, thanks so much you for having you're me, not, man. Yeah. Thank you. All right. See you soon. Thank you, our listeners for listening to yet another episode of Red Dad Show. 
As always, if you want to get in touch, just email me at editor at raddadshow.com. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere you're listening to podcasts. It really helps to promote the show and let others know. Till next time.